Okay, hello everyone. Um, I guess it's a couple of minutes after the hour, so we're going to get started. Um, so, uh, welcome to the uh, AWEA O&M Committee Recommended Practices Webinar, Part 6. Uh, the title of this webinar is uh, Grease Sampling and Analysis, um, which is the subject of uh, Recommended Practices 812 to 815. Um, this is Bruce Hamilton of Navigant Consulting. I'll be serving as your moderator today. And uh, the, uh, a little bit about the uh, webinar. Um, the recommended practices um, is a collection of, of uh, documents that the uh, O&M committee within OEA has provided over the last couple of years to give guidance to the wind industry regarding um, various uh, O&M practices. And then this one would be on the practice of grease sampling and analysis of key wind turbine components. Uh, this webinar will provide background on the research that led to these practices, the current ASTM standards for sampling and analysis that form the basis of wind turbine specific instructions found in these practices, and finally recommendations on how to properly establish a grease sampling and analysis program to support condition monitoring. Um, so uh, the uh, next slide shows uh, uh, picture of myself and also our main speaker today, which is Rich Wurzbach, who is president of MRG Laboratories. And both of us are members of the uh, Condition-Based Maintenance Subcommittee within the O&M Committee. And I'm going to introduce uh, Rich in, in more detail in a second, but first a uh, couple of housekeeping items. Um, wanted to uh, bring everybody's attention to the uh, chat function. All of you are muted, so if you have any questions, uh, you can submit them by the chat function. It's on the left of your screen, and uh, all of uh, Rich and myself will be able to see those, as well as uh, a person behind the scenes named Keisha James from AWEA, and so she's the one that's actually the mastermind of uh, the technology here. So I uh, um, also want to let everyone know that today's program is being recorded, and the slides and the webinar recording will be uh, sent out to all of you in a, in a web and uh, an email tomorrow. And uh, let's see, uh, there are also um, uh, links that I will direct, I'll direct your attention to at the end of this where you can uh, get copies of previous uh, webinars. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to see to start off with a, a polling question, which is I think the next slide. Uh, yeah, so we're using this polling function, um, and this is kind of a warm-up question. And just for those of you, um, you can click on the appropriate box here. So the question is, what is your experience with grease sampling and analysis? Is it great, a, or is it okay? Is it sometimes okay, occasionally, or just generally doesn't work for you? And if you don't have any experience at all, you don't need to answer. But just uh, I'll give you a, a minute or so to uh, respond, and uh, we can follow along. You can see that uh, choice B so far is a clear leader, okay experience. Okay. Give you another half a minute to answer that. So we've got these sprinkled uh, throughout the presentation in a couple of places just to uh, make sure you're all awake, awake and alert. Okay. Nobody thinks it's great, but most of you think it's okay, and uh, a couple of you don't think it's working for you very well. So that's probably good because Rich can help in that area. So uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, just a little bit more background on the uh, O&M committee. Uh, it was actually formed all, all of five years ago, and it's been a collection of people, probably more than 100, uh, maybe closer to 200 people that are on these various subcommittees. Uh, there's uh, eight of them, and uh, uh, you can see the, the, the last one, condition-based maintenance, is the one that uh, has been uh, uh, developing this particular RP. And all of these are available to members for free, by, uh, you can see the link at the bottom of the screen, and uh, they're available for a fee for non-members. Okay, next slide. Okay, so a little bit more about uh, grease sampling and analysis. Uh, the goal of this webinar 
uh, is to help you to determine the proper uh, recommended practice for sampling applications in wind turbines. And, and that's because there are actually four different um, uh, recommended practices covered in this. So uh, Rich will get into those in some detail. And then to decide which of the test methods to be performed on grease samples are uh, appropriate for wind turbines. And finally, to the trend and develop action criteria in response to these analyses. Okay. So before I turn it over to Rich, let me give you a little bit of background about Rich. Uh, he has 25 years of experience in the development of predictive maintenance programs and the applications of diagnostic technologies for industrial equipment. Uh, he, is, he, uh, he holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Millersville University in Pennsylvania, and he has experience in the nuclear, biomedical research, and pharmaceutical manufacturing industries in the applications of pre predictive maintenance and maintenance optimization. He has numerous certifications related to lubricant specialties, and he has designed numerous innovative products to improve the practice of oil sampling and analysis. And last but not least, he invented and developed the Grease Thief, a tool for sampling and analysis of lubricating greases. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rich, uh, starting with slide six. It's all yours, Rich. Thank you, Bruce. And, and you can hear me okay? I can. Super. Bruce, thanks for that introduction. Um, glad to have the opportunity here today to uh, present this material that, as Bruce pointed out, we've been working on for a number of years. And, and so I'm going to start with a little bit of background. Uh, Greece uh, certainly lags uh, oil when it comes to sampling and analysis. So I'm going to start there just to lead us into lubricant sampling in general. Uh, oil analysis, which is something that, that folks may be interested in or are experienced with, uh, they could be applied in wind turbines to for perhaps the main gearbox. Uh, the sampling is uh, achieved usually using valves and gravity to allow the oil to flow out of the reservoir, the gearbox, what have you. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, folks are using drop tube sampling, what we refer to as drop tube sampling. You can see the illustration here of that. Uh, where uh, someone has put a tube in at the top, they kind of let it drop inside, and wherever it ends up in there is where we suck the oil out using a vacuum pump. Uh, sometimes the machines are retrofitted with what might be called a mini mess or a sampling valve. Uh, that allows a, a more consistent location for the sample to be taken. We're talking about taking oil samples. But in any case, uh, we've found over years that, that it's very important where the sample is located. And when we resort to this drop tube method, there's some uncertainty of where the oil sample is being taken. So it's with this kind of background that uh, uh, there's been an approach to grease uh, sampling in kind of the same way. Uh, how can we be sure uh, we get a good sample? So historically, grease sampling has been achieved during disassembly, say following a failure or some kind of routine analysis when the part is back in the shop. It can be fully disassembled, and the grease can be extracted. Um, this is usually done using a screwdriver or other handy tools that we happen to have around. The cleanliness of the method is usually fairly poor, so that we're introducing particulate uh, for analysis that wasn't really there in the machine. Uh, samples are usually uh, available uh, near access ports or points. Um, it can be considered a grab sample, and these grab samples have similar limitations to the drop tube sampling method that I talked about for oil analysis. So the ASTM Grease uh, Subcommittee in initiated a working group back in 2009 to develop a sampling standard, and it's with that initial work um, while that was underway that uh, I got involved with the AWEA uh, o and uh, working group on condition monitoring. And so it's the basis of the work done by ASTM uh, for standards for grease sampling that has informed and uh, provided input to development of the recommended practices. In the same time frame, there was projects initiated in the U.S. and in Denmark uh, to test the effectiveness of grease sampling in the 2010 to 2012 time frame. And I'm going to talk about some of the findings from those uh, projects and research initiatives. So historically, like I say, you take, get the uh, bearing back, uh, gearbox, what have you, back to the shop. You disassemble it, at least partially, and then you reach inside and try to extract the grease. And so here's a photograph uh, taken from a major wind OEM uh, uh, workshop 
where the technician is uh, has partially disassembled the uh, the bearing and then is kind of grabbing the grease from between the rollers with the idea that if I can get the grease from these locations, that's going to have the most information. It's going to provide me um, an overview of what's happening uh, in that bearing, and uh, I can make some judgments based on that. The only problem with that is that at this point, um, you know, the kind of decisions that we can make in the field are really uh, are gone at that at that point. It's back in the shop. It's been disassembled. Um, either the equipment is out of service, or there's some other bearing that's that's back in service. And so the idea is, yes, yeah, it's, it's great to have that sample. It can tell us a lot of information. But is there a way that we can get better samples in the field, such that those can tell us the same kind of information without having to take uh, and disassemble the component uh, to this degree to get the sample? And so an active sampler was developed uh, initially for valve gearboxes in the nuclear power industry. And Bruce mentioned that that was part of my background, my, my work background. And we started doing some research early on uh, to be able to take samples from these valve gearboxes. Uh, the original design of that was to take a small syringe-like tool that you see in the photograph to the lower left and to attach that to a handle of sorts that allowed its introduction inside the, the barriers of the machine so that we could target uh, the location of interest and not just happen to grab any grease that happened to be sitting out on the periphery. Um, on the lower right, you see that T-handle design, and that's actually the most recent design uh, that came out of this research in Denmark with the Danish wind industry that I, that I mentioned earlier. So now there is a tool that can go inside the machine, can access the inside of the machine, target that live zone, that live area uh, of grease that's active in lubrication and has information about the condition of the component. Uh, wear monitoring is uh, one of the things that we would want to measure. So in a trying to assess the effectiveness of our sampling methodology, we focused in on the ability to consistently get results from samples taken in this way. And so we can see that uh, this method that's shown here is using that grease sampler, using that, that format, if you will, that, that geometry, and using what's called a Hall effect sensor uh, to measure its uh, overall parts per million of ferrous debris. And several methods were evaluated here. Uh, uh, the consistency of the method was uh, using this uh, Hall effect sensor was down on the order of 3% uh, relative standard deviation, which is much better than some other methods that were available. Primarily, we used this as a way to evaluate uh, some test stands. And again, back to the uh, gearboxes, the grease lubricated valve gearboxes, we were able to run a test where uh, we were taking samples over time uh, and established kind of a baseline condition. And then we made a deliberate litmus alignment of the gears uh, in that gearbox and then continued sampling periodically. And it was a clear change in the rate of wear generation using that uh, methodology for ferrous debris. So that was helpful in, in validating the sampling method and its ability to detect uh, changes in wear rate due to changing conditions in the component. So from that research, uh, a two-year project was conducted with uh, Dong Energy and Vattenfall, which are two of the largest offshore wind operators. Uh, the uh, project enlisted uh, Dr. Kim, Kim Espenson, an internationally recognized expert uh, from Denmark, um, from uh, Elborg University, uh, actually an expert in what's called the theory of sampling. So yes, there's a theory behind this, and, uh, and we apply these fundamental principles of sampling methodology to come up with a, an appropriate main-bearing wind, uh, uh, wind turbine uh, sampling uh, method for this project. It was a systematic evaluation of the heterogeneity of the grease. So unlike an oil sample, which once you take the sample, you can shake it up very thoroughly, distribute the particulate and, 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 and contents that are in there evenly, and then analyze that. Grease doesn't behave that same way, so we have to take into account what is the variation of, of these particles and these contents. Uh, we looked at sampling methodology. We, we validated this analysis uh, 
and uh, looked at the repeatability of this for wind bearings. Uh, we looked at both onshore and offshore applications with the primary goal here to uh, be able to come out with uh, methodologies appropriate for the offshore uh, wind industry in Denmark. The results of these studies were published uh, at the Oil Doc Conference in Germany, at uh, LubeMat, uh, another international conference, and at the AWEA um, uh, national meeting. Uh, as this was going on, ASTM was working on the standards for grease sampling and analysis. Uh, this research was incorporated into these standard developments. Uh, there was the inclusion of some historical methods uh, uh, to include what folks were primarily using as methods for taking greases up to that point. Uh, this method uh, sta standard uh, practice uh, included failed component sampling, uh, talked about the care that's needed in obtaining samples or, or sometimes that we need to take, may need to take multiple samples uh, to get a meaningful picture of what's going on. It talked about the use of tubing, how uh, using suction uh, may not be completely adequate in the, and that there was some possibility of peripheral grease sampling if the right methods are not used. And this standard uh, included the new technologies for active and passive sampling. Uh, some of the terms that were used, some of the scope of this method, which became ASTM D7718, the standard practice for in-service free sampling, uh, talked about um, various components that could be sampled, uh, talked about when there would be requirements for taking multiple samples, talked about both passive and active sampling, passive being the installation of a sampling fitting, perhaps, on the machine, grabbing the the purge grease uh, as it exited the machine versus active sampling, which would be attaching the sampler to a device where you could actively position that within the machine to, to target the location of the sample. Um, it, it talked about actuating this uh, sampler that you see pictured below to take the four samples, and it mentioned some of the hazards and cautions to get a good and consistent method. On the left, that's a picture of the passive pre-sampling device. Uh, it has a thread on it, which allows it to be threaded into the machine. It has a piston, which gets displaced by the purging grease. It has a um, position uh, for a purge hole so that if it were to fill up, excess grease could purge out. And the most recent grease will be captured as it exits the machine. On the right, we have a picture of the active pre-sampling device, or an example of one where there's a stinger probe on the front of it. That Singer probe is the key difference between the two, and it allows the feeling of the target component. So it could be inserted until coming in contact with a bearing element or a gear uh, to position it right adjacent to those components to get a representative sample. The general procedures in the ASTM method include the cleanliness of the sample tools, how important that is. Uh, that we don't uh, cross-contaminate between samples and don't introduce, introduce contaminants. Uh, talked about the homogeneity of the samples, uh, the uniformity and design of the devices, the importance of operator training and the knowledge of the equipment being sampled. And this is, this is very important where if we don't understand where the target component is or how grease flows within the machine, it's going to be very difficult to get a representative sample. So uh, making sure that the operator is well trained, knows how to use the tool, and understands the target location within, within the machine is very important in getting a representative sample. Talks also about shipping considerations, making sure we don't compromise the sample in shipping making sure it's properly labeled so that the laboratory has a very clear picture of uh, what component this came from and what, they, you know, what is being analyzed and that the results get properly uh, attached to the right component that was sampled. And then using the containers and protective sleeves to protect the leakage and co-mixing those samples until they get into the hands of those doing the analysis. Here you can see this active sampling. Uh, talks about the stinger probe to get it adjacent to that target surface using that extended handle to reach uh, a set depth. So while the stinger probe can help us if we are not sure of the depth of the target component, if we already know that we must, say, insert it 2 inches or 18 centimeters prior to pulling the sample until we get to that target zone, we can also set up that handle to that depth 
and uh, insert it in a closed position until it reaches that depth, and then essentially core the sample adjacent to the component to get to that live uh, zone. Uh, talks about uh, tubing uh, to extract the sample with suction. Talks about using things like spatulas and other soft tools to extract it from an accessible surface uh, where it is very close to the location that we are gaining access to within the machine. So here's a few uh, pictures of what would be considered active sampling. Uh, the center picture, uh, kind of a cartoon, if you will, a little bit with, uh, with you can see the active sampler uh, coming in contact with the gear there. It has a stinger probe uh, on, the, on that, and the stinger probe is um, is uh, contacting that gear, and then it's coring that sample. Off to the right, there's a picture of a, a main bearing for a wind turbine. This is one that doesn't have an access point. It doesn't have a, a plug that can be removed or any kind of opening like that. So the grease that is coming out through the shield area uh, is being uh, accessed with a spatula, being placed into a syringe, and then put into the grease uh, sampler. Off to the left is a picture of a sample being taken from a slewing bearing. So that might be a, a yaw bearing, let's say, that would have a, an access plug and a, maybe a very fluid grease that, that could be uh, moved under vacuum. So it talks about some of these different approaches. Uh, it also talks about failure analysis. And uh, when we do have failure, there's a lot of value in being able to extract as much information about the factors that led to that. Uh, so in the ASTM standard, again, it talks about proper handling of that specimen, keeping it clean, keeping it protected until it gets to the location for the analysis, about separating external dirt and debris so it doesn't get mixed in with the grease that was in the bearing, the way in which we remove the shields and the seals to access this location, uh, how we get the grease sample, the need possibly for multiple samples to see different things going on in that surface, and then correlating what we see there uh, in the observed conditions, once the grease is out of the way on the surface of the bearing and the rollers and so forth, and correlating that to the history that we have and metallurgy that we might uh, notice on the failure analysis. So at this point, we're going to put another um, interactive poll up here, and this is to ask where you're currently sampling, and we're going to open this up to lubricants. So just click uh, those uh, answers uh, where you are sampling uh, oils or greases. We'll give you a few minutes to respond. One thing that I didn't think about with this is um, I'm not sure if this is a response that allows response that allows you to click multiple um, answers, and that may that may prove a little challenging. I don't know if uh, Keisha are able to to weigh in on that. I probably should have made clear that we should be able to choose more than one response. I just tried that, Rich, and it looks like it only allows you to do one. Oh, I see. Uh, I just clicked a checkbox at the bottom. Apparently, I have access to this. I just clicked a checkbox that says allow multiple responses. Oh, so, there you go. Uh, now you can do it. I just tried that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for, for those of you who, who are being forced to choose from one or the other, and you have multiple responses there, I'll give you a minute to come back and, and click a few more there. And it looks like the, the leading locations are gearbox and main bearing greases. Also see uh, yaw uh, in there as well, and uh, hydraulic oil. So good, some pretty good good responses. So we see that, you know, gear, it's no surprise that gearbox oil is the, the primary location, obviously very critical uh, component from a reliability perspective, uh, but also not far behind main bearing greases. And so when we couple the fact that we got, you know, quite a few responses of people looking at main bearing greases, but maybe not everyone being extremely uh, happy with the results, Hopefully we can extract some value out of uh, you know what we're going over here today with our sampling methodology and our analysis tools. So thank you for those who, who, who did respond to that survey question. So here are the RPs, the recommended practices for grease sampling. 
Bruce mentioned that there's four RPs. One of them is related to analysis. So these three are focusing on the sampling. And what we have out there right now are, are uh, sampling methods for the main bearings, for the generator bearings, and for the pitch bearings. And so when I see how many responses we got there from the poll, it sounds like we should probably look for efforts to, uh, in the future, add yaw bearings as well, because there definitely seems to be interest around that area. Uh, the main bearing RP includes methods uh, with and without drain access plugs, because we do have different uh, styles and designs out there. Uh, so we're giving methodologies for both. Um, and it includes an alternate method for a spatula rather than an active sampler, even in those that do have a drain access flow. Uh, that's RP-812. RP-813 uh, is a generator bearing sampling, and it addresses sampling from generators that have a chute or a deflector at the bottom. Uh, many of them are designed uh, to be relubricated so that there's an exit point uh, that usually uh, directs that grease to a some kind of uh, tray, um, but it also talks about sampling with a spatula rather than an active sampler. And then finally, RP814, which is the pitch bearing procedure, uh, gives methods for sampling from the purge container, because many of these uh, do have a little catch container that kind of travels around with the pitch bearings, uh, or, uh, you know, removing such containers and then sampling backwards into the purge path. Uh, it talks about purge containers with and without lids, and it does discuss that uh, it may require some smaller dimension tools in some uh, geometries of uh, the styles of bearings that are out there. For main bearing sampling, uh, we, we should keep in mind that the grease flow is dependent on temperature and bearing movement, and it is somewhat dependent on the grease itself, of course. Uh, but it will change based off changes in temperature and the movement of the bearing. Uh, the active sampler and the T-handle that were described earlier can be used to capture uh, uh, flowing grease. In other words, when the grease in the area that it flows as it's being moved and drug around by the rollers, those, that is the area that we would want to target. So in the Denmark uh, offshore uh, wind research project that I mentioned, uh, the T-handle the that I showed uh, previously uh, was uh, a later evolution from the one that's shown in the small picture below. It was uh, more of a prototype there shown in the uh, early efforts of that uh, program, but we learned some things from that. Um, it was difficult to hold in place, uh, difficult to uh, do the coring that is required, and so it was modified to this T-handle that allowed you to firmly place it on the side of the housing and then core the sample to a precise location inside. Uh, and so there's some methods there uh, to do that. There's the access plug that's being used in that picture, but also without the drain access plug. And uh, this is a, kind of a screenshot from the, um, from the RP for the main bearing sampling. And it shows uh, some of the pictures and some of the instructions where the uh, sampling device is placed into an inner rod that's going to hold the handle of that and then that you know, slides into an outer tube, which holds the body. And from holding both the, the inner handle and the outer body, it's possible to keep it in the closed position as it enters the bearing housing until it gets to that preset depth that we want to start taking the sample. And then the body essentially slides forward uh, to core that sample adjacent to those rolling elements. It also talks about when there is no drain access. In this picture I showed earlier, uh, grease flowing, you know, uh, the excess grease as it exits the bearing. It uh, talks about it's important to first kind of clean away or clear away any grease that's been uh, sitting there for an extended period of time because it has a tendency to track particulate, uh, dirt, and so forth. Uh, we don't really want that to be part of the sample, so we kind of wipe that away. And we obtain our sample from the grease that's lying underneath, hopefully the grease that's more recently exited the bearing housing and has information about the condition of the grease, about the, any wear particles that have been generated, and any contaminants that are present not externally but are present inside the housing and in the grease. Uh, the grease flow is typically, uh, for this is for the generator now, generator bearing sampling. The grease flow is typically through a drain chute or an opening to a catch basin that's 
quite popular design. Um, large amounts of older grease may be present in that drain area, but they're not necessarily representative of the current condition, and that's what we want to capture that current condition to see, you know, what's happening now, um, you know, not what's been mixed with dirt that's outside, but what is the current status of the generator bearings. That same revised T-handle uh, uh, has been used in this uh, methodology. Uh, we have found that some drain shoots are so long that removal of the drain shoot is per per preferred uh, prior to sampling to improve access to the live zone because it may have a fairly long extended zone of old grease uh, and we want to get past that and into the live zone. So that's discussed in that recommended practice. I have a couple pictures here that show how this method can work, and you can see that um, the, uh, the tube here is being moved forward. Uh, we're up through. We've removed the, the drain chute from the bottom of that generator bearing, and then the grease is extracted back out, and that little yellow piece at the end is that clear-bodied grease sampler with a little bit of the grease uh, on the outside of it. And so with that now, there's that one, uh, about one gram sample that can be used for analysis. And so the two methods that are outlined here, one is using that T-handle that we just saw pictured there to try to get a live zone near the moving portion of the bearing rollers. And it could be a pretty, pretty far up inside. It could be you know, several inches away. So that if we were just to gra grab the grease that we can get to, it really may not uh, give us information related to what's going on in that generator. There is another method that talks about using a spatula and a syringe to extract grease from the drain path, but it's uh, going to be more difficult to do that. And in fact, there's some cautions in the method that say we have to ensure that there's a sufficient amount of older grease has been removed from that purge path so that we only get that live zone grease in our sample. At the driven end of the generator, uh, the bearing may have a smaller reservoir due to the presence of the shaft. And if we overextended that sampler, we'll likely hit the shaft. So there's some questions in there like that. Uh, on the opposite driven of the driven end, um, the bearing may not encounter a shaft. Um, so, the, so the depth setting must be determined prior to insertion, or we possibly risk overshooting that live zone and getting into another kind of dead zone of the grease, if you will. The third RP is for pinch bearing sampling. It talks about different methods uh, to catch, uh, to take the samples from the drain catch containers of different styles. So it talks about a couple different styles that could be encountered uh, depending on who the OEM is. Uh, there's also a method outlined for accessing grease from the, <coughs> from the drain path using a spatula. And there's a further uh, enhanced method under investigation uh, right now in the Danish wind industry, same group that previously developed the main bearing um, uh, methodology. They have a blade bearing grease sampling research project using a slim extractor. So recognizing that the access uh, path from the drain of the bearing is sometimes smaller than the sampler uh, that we showed previously, a slimmer version of that down to about 8 millimeters in diametrical clearance is being used to take better samples uh, uh, from that as well. Uh, the grease in this case uh, is transferred to a passive sampler for analysis. And then, of course, it's important here to label each of the three pitch bearing designations so that we can take the appropriate follow-up action. If we find that one of the three bearings is, is in bad shape, we have to make sure that our sampling, uh, our sample labeling methodology will uh, will allow us to go back and pinpoint which of those bearings needs further attention. Again, a screenshot here from the pitch bearing sampling. Uh, it shows one of these uh, styles of, uh, kind of call that a bellows style um, purge container, where that can be removed and sampled. Or once that's removed, we can reach back up inside that uh, bearing housing and take a sample even closer to the live zone, uh, more representative sample from, the, from that pitch bearing. Some of the general sampling considerations that are, are listed and included uh, are uh, these uh, issues about uh, making sure we get there to the live zone of the bearing. Um, that's where we need to be taking the grease. So again, the knowledge of the, the layout and the geometry of that housing uh, is important to make sure we have the right tools and the right methods. Um, Transfer to a passive sampling device is not required in all cases, but it may be 
uh, uh, might be helpful to ensure that uh, the right quantity is obtained for analysis, and it may streamline some subsequent analysis, as we'll talk about. Uh, it's important to place the sample in a shipping container to prevent leakage because oil can separate from the thickener. And on the analysis side, we want to make sure that we're getting the, the same ratio of oil and thickener than is pre that is present uh, in the wind-bearing uh, housing location so that we can assess if it's appropriate or degraded in any way. <clears throat> and we want to avoid damage and contamination of the sample. And then we want to put a label on there. We want to fill out the necessary information clearly and legibly. We want to include the equipment identification, the sample date and time, uh, who took the sample, any notes or observations for the lab, and uh, sometimes we can have a barcode that's on there, and that barcode can really streamline that and that, uh, that identification process, make sure that the results we're getting from the laboratory really meet up with, uh, you know, the, the right uh, sample that was taken. So that's the overview of the first three uh, RPs, the RPs that are uh, focusing on the sampling process. And I want to shift gears now into the analysis area, um, start by talking a little bit about the background of grease analysis techniques. Um, I've started with uh, you know, one of these samplers that we've been talking about showing up at the lab uh, in a protective uh, uh, tube. And the first test being run is this uh, Ferris debris monitoring test. This is a coil or a hall, what we call a hall effect sensor. And based on the amount of ferrous debris that's present, uh, it'll change the field of that coil, and that can be calibrated to give us a result in parts per million ferrous debris. Uh, so it's kind of a quick, uh, repeatable uh, test. Uh, when we did the um, studies in Denmark, uh, we were taking four samples uh, from each location in the field. Uh, the samples were split. Two samples were sent to a laboratory in Denmark. Uh, two samples uh, sent to a laboratory in the United States. And we found that all four samples agreed uh, less than 1% variation in the values that we got. So very good agreement on that test um, uh, and, uh, you know, very quick and, and repeatable test. Uh, the, the sampler here then can be uh, evaluated for consistency changes. That's the hardness or the softness of the grease by performing a dye extrusion. So this small one gram sample can be squeezed out essentially uh, through a narrow um, flow channel. And the back pressure created can be measured as a way of evaluating the changes in consistency as it's compared to the new fresh grease. In the center is an actual photograph of the extruded film of grease, which can then be split off and run into a number of different tests. So it's in this way that we can uh, kind of set expectations for a fairly small sample quantity, uh, down, like I said, down to a gram, and then perform a number of different tests from that. The STM standards for in-service greases, we have the D7718, D which was developed back in 2011 for uh, taking small samples, and the sample size is about a gram. Uh, that quantity is not sufficient for most of the previously existing ASTM standards for grease, which were uh, mostly designed for new greases, for batch testing, uh, for verifying properties of the new grease. Um, earlier this year, ASTM released uh, D7918, which is a method using an integrated tester, and that's the, uh, the image that I showed previously. So with the samplers that are outlined in 7718 in the analysis process in 7918, there's a method to take consistent one-gram samples and do a number of different tests, including dye this dye extrusion that I spoke about, uh, first debris levels, uh, looking for antioxidants, looking at the color variation of the grease, which can tell us if the right grease is being used, if it's aging, if it's contaminating, um, all with one gram of grease. So the fourth RP, fourth recommended practice is RP815. And um, the, uh, what we find here is that the OEMs may require grease analysis more often during initial startup when new turbines. Uh, grease analysis can be performed every six months or annually. really depends on the maintenance practices. Generally speaking, we don't see folks uh, climbing towers just to take a grease sample, so it's really going to be aligned to other up-tower trips, uh, grease, grease samples being taken at that time. Um, 
The typical uh, test slate uh, would include a routine type test, some exception tests, component specific tests, or even environment specific tests. And so we'll look at a table that lays them out. The frequency selected by the owner uh, or the turbine OEM, depending on you know, what kind of relationship or, or what kind of service contract may be in place. And the routine, the recurring test, should be made to achieve the operator's reliability goals. Might might reflect local environmental considerations as well. So as we choose these, these are the things that we see in the, the 815 recommended practice. Here's our test selection matrix. Talks about the, root, the examples of routine tests, which could be ferrous debris, quantification, how much wear is present, uh, consistency testing. It could be either you know uh, kind of a screening test. This can be done manually or by the die extrusion method. Uh, looking at the visual appearance of the grease or changes in its color. Um, screening for contaminants and mixing using the FTIR test. It's a test that can also be used for seeing how oxidized the grease is, or we can use a, a, an antioxidant uh, level quantification using something like the ruler test, um, which allows us to say how, many, uh, how much of the additives that were there in the new grease are still present and how much have been consumed by the oxidation stresses on the grease. And then elemental spectroscopy, and that's a complementary to ferrous debris quantification. It looks at just more than more than just the iron content, but looks at other uh, alloying elements and other wear metals as well, such as copper um, and uh, uh, chromium, some of the other elements that we might see under conditions of wear. Uh, an exception test uh, could be inconsistency. We might do some advanced, such as cone penetration, if we have a large enough quantity of grease to see just where it stands relative to new grease, or a test called rheometry, which can be done with a smaller quantity, but very accurately look at the flow characteristics, the tendency of the grease to separate the oil from the uh, thickener, and its tendency to channel or tunnel, uh, and then subsequently starve the, the component for lubrication. Other advanced uh, or exception-based tests could be analytical ferrography, where the particles are separated out, looked at under a microscope and identified. Patch microscopy, very similar to that. Rheometry that I talked about. Maybe some more advanced FTIR testing for looking for mixing or contaminants present. A, a test like PGA, DSC for oxidation type properties. And then maybe a component specific or environment specific test might be water down to the parts per million level. That might be of interest for the pitch bearings that tend to be out there and exposed uh, more so than others, or in a very wet environment such as offshore applications. So at this point, um, another survey opportunity for you. Uh, among the analyses resulting from the sample grease, which performance parameter do you care about most? And so the grease consistency, uh, you know, is the grease hardened or softened? Uh, what is the wear, how many wear particles are there? How about water and other contaminants or oxidation and aging? And I will allow multiple responses. It does say, um, you know, which do you care about most, but maybe you've got two that are e of equal importance. So I'll give a moment for that reply. Yeah, it looks like a lot, lot around uh, wear particles uh, and then a decent amount around oxidation and aging so that we can perhaps optimize the, the life of the grease or, or get a better idea of <clears throat> um, how frequently we may add, need to add or replace grease. Thank you for your responses. Uh, where's the value for grease analysis, the, the full analysis? Basically, all you know, most of the different tests we can do to fully characterize uh, an entire wind turbine might be three pitch bearings, two main bearings, two generator bearings can be less than $1,000, so in the order of hundreds of dollars. And there's some abbreviated test slates for screening samples that might be even lower cost. Um, maybe use them to target more advanced analysis based on those screening tests. Some problems that we identify can potentially be corrected up to hour for just maybe a couple thousand dollars. Uh, and this is as opposed to a single main bearing failure uh, on the order of several hundred thousand dollars for, or more. So the opportunity is can we identify these issues, uh, you know, in conjunction with another planned up tower visit uh, and, and, and correct them uh, and in the process avoid 
the significant downtime and high costs of an unexpected or catastrophic bearing failure. And some of these things where, let's say, we identify grease mixing and we intervene and we flush that out, uh, we may avoid that failure altogether just by having the analysis results and being able to apply them to our maintenance strategies. A couple of case studies for you. Um, <clears throat> here's some uh, back bearings from a uh, wind farm. Uh, you can see we've got them listed here. Uh, you know, it's maybe about 20 or so different wind turbines. And this is that dye extrusion test that I talked about, the <clears throat> grease consistency measurement. You can see there are two uh, outliers uh, significantly lower than, than the rest of those. That would allow us to look at that fleet, maybe target that those two, compo uh, two components to come up with uh, looking at maintenance history or other uh, influences, maybe the age of the grease, and intervene before they uh, could be, become a problem. What happens when the grease consistency gets real soft or real hard? Well, it interferes with lubrication and ultimately can lead to greater wear and eventual failure in the bearing. Here we are looking at wear levels from across the wind farm. You can see that uh, the majority of these are on the order of a couple hundred to maybe a thousand or so ppm, but there's three definite outliers, uh, Tower 48 at about 5,000 parts per million, Tower 49 at 14,000, and Tower 56 at 18,000. So it becomes clear that we can we can get out there and, and do some follow-up analysis, look at our condition monitoring vibration analysis perhaps, maybe even schedule some of these severe ones for a uh, boroscopic inspection and do some proactive work to avoid failure. Some of the reports can be generated. Uh, we'll have things like a summary uh, icon that gives us some color coding, maybe red, yellow, green color coding, and wear, consistency, contamination, oxidation condition, some different sections that give us the monitoring history and the trends, uh, and some comments and rec recommendations, <clears throat> basically giving us some good advice on what to do and how to act on these results. When it comes to developing action criteria, we want to consult the lab for help with interpreting results, understanding the lab, resort, lab reports. Uh, we want to set appropriate alarms. They might be min or max. They might be a percent change or a deviation, especially in something like wear trends. That might vary based on machine and the population of the sample data. And then if there's ever an opportunity to inspect uh, a removed wind turbine, uh, component and then correlate back that, uh, that back to the uh, grease analysis trends. That expands our knowledge base, allows us for more accurate uh, action criteria going forward. We can use statistical tools such as plus or minus two sigma uh, or advanced statistics to assign some scoring values to know which, uh, which components I want to do either advanced grease analysis or other analysis or, or, or target those for, for maintenance. Um, we talked about the vibe analysis, the bore scope inspections, and it's important to know that different locations might vary significantly. Um, you might have a main bearing where its criteria for action is 1,000 ppm, while a pitch bearing may be 10,000 in the same turbine. It has to do with the rate of replenishment of grease and the typical um, levels of wear that are generated for these locations. So to summarize, the grease in the live zone area is accessed by active, by active sampling. It's very, very well mixed. It'd be comparable to samples taken in the shop between the rollers and the bearing, and that's based off of the findings of the offshore wind industry um, uh, uh, work that was done in Denmark. The bearings removed from service following the field sampling and analysis uh, corresponded precisely to the predicted condition when disassembled and characterized also from that study. So our in-service analysis complements the condition monitoring system, such as vibration. And it's particularly useful in the low-speed shafts, where some of the vibration and lint trends will, will perhaps lag grease condition. Uh, the grease sampling and analysis have these ASPM methods to follow, and there's some proven success out there, not only in the wind industry, but others as well. And our early detection uh, can sometimes be corrected in the field by grease flushing, relubrication, reduce that cost and risk of failure. Uh, at this point, uh, I'll pass this back over to Bruce to kind of give us our wrap-up and, and some questions. Okay, thank, thank you, Rich, for that outstanding presentation. Um, and this is a slide that just shows um, the other RPs that are have been produced by the Condition-Based Maintenance Subcommittee and the authors that are there. You can see Rich had, was the primary author of the four that we, they just presented. Um, 
So uh, what I would like to uh, ask all of you to do is ask any questions using the chat function. It's on the left side. We've got about 10 minutes remaining, so uh, we've got time for some questions. Um, and here's one that's come across. Um, if you have not performed a grease analysis in the past, how do we know what appropriate action levels would be for a given location or a piece of equipment? Right, and, that, and that's a great question. So, and it's something that, that you know we will encounter with uh, with folks that are you know trying for the first time. And I would say that even if you've done it before, uh, you may have to keep in mind that if you have a different location, let's say you know a a shore based wind turbine versus a desert based wind turbine, um, wind turbines that uh, are operating with a lot of um, buffeting, you know, variations in wind and that sort of thing, you may find that there's different criteria for these, uh, for these variations. I would say that the best thing to do is work with the laboratory, uh, use a laboratory that has some experience in the area of wind turbine uh, analysis, and work with them uh, to, to draw some initial criteria based off of other similar components. And this is where you can help by providing the laboratory with information like what OEM turbines are you using, where the sample's coming from, what kind of, how quickly are you replenishing the grease, these sort of things. And working together with the laboratory, that can help you get a start right off the bat, but eventually you're going to want to kind of supplement that with your own findings uh, and your own criteria over time, start to use the statistical tools that I talked about to make the smart decisions of when to stop and when to act. But some of the folks I've worked with have you know, done this for a period of time and then selected maybe the worst actors to do a follow-up bore scope inspection. And once we, once we start to see at what levels does it seem to correlate to action, action points where I'd want to intervene and take action, now I can, I can factor that in and continue, have that continuous improvement uh, approach uh, to enhance the, the criteria we're using for action. Okay, thank you. Um, got another question here. Uh, do you have any idea as to um, what, at what uh, criteria to set up for, uh, for the metal density level for main bearings? Yeah, so if we're using the Ferris, uh, the FDM that I talked about, the Ferris density uh, measurement, which is a parts per million in Ferris debris, um, for the most part, like for a main bearing, around 1,000 is kind of an initial cutoff to say, you know, if it's under 1,000, that's, that's pretty. And this kind of surprises folks who are used to doing oil analysis, uh, say with a, a gearbox or what have you. I think the criteria there would be considered much lower. But the reason is, is that grease uh, is cumulative. In other words, grease, the particles don't settle out of the grease as the, in the way that they do in a, an oil lubricated component. And so we end up setting higher uh, criteria, action criteria. But 1,000 might be a, a good kind of trigger point. Um, and then once we get that, we might say, well, then for those that are higher than that, let's do some advanced analysis. Let's create a ferrography slide and look at the particles and see what kind of particles they are. Are we having fretting wear? Are we having, uh, which is an oxidized metal? Are we having uh, cutting wear from contaminants, severe sliding wear from advanced wear? So that's where we can really pinpoint what is the nature of the wear mechanism that's taking place. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we've got about five minutes left. We've got probably time for another couple of questions. Uh, here's one. Um, when grease is in bad shape, uh, the color and appearance changes. So why can't I just observe the grease instead of sending it off to a laboratory? Isn't there some way to do some quick on-site tests that can be acted on immediately instead of waiting days or longer for a lab to reply? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and I think especially um, when when folks are um, you know have a little little bit of experience uh, with uh, some laboratory level analysis, uh, and they've seen some kind of cause and effect and that sort of thing, you really want to graduate to a point where you could do some kind of field evaluation. The only problem with color alone is that um, you can get fairly high levels of wear with a minimal effect on color if the grease uh, is otherwise not subjected to oxidation conditions. So that's my caution that, that you know, the color alone doesn't really uh, hit that. Plus you have the issue of, of uh, perception. Uh, people just staring, you know, looking at the grease. Does it look dark to you? It doesn't quite to me. But, but in keeping with that, um, the, the, the first debris monitoring test is a field deployable test. 
And so that's something that could be done in the field. And there is some work on um, some field uh, units to do um, quantitative colorimetry, where you can kind of go beyond just the human eye gut feel to actually quantifying changes and give some criteria uh, in the field for those samples, which we would want to send on to a lab or look at further. OK. And uh, uh, we've got one more question, but my, my screen just went blank. Hold on one second. Let me refresh it. OK, here we go. Where can we order one of the testing tools to use with a main bearing that has an inspection port? OK, well, I, I'm, I'm try, I want to keep this as, uh, as uh, technically uh, as possible. But uh, in response to a specific question, I'll say that one, one location that you can find these tools is greasethief.com. And uh, there are a number of laboratories uh, around the states and uh, in Europe at this point that are offering analysis. So you can possibly just do a, a Google search on grease thief. Uh, that, that might help you get to some of the, the laboratories that can do that as well. But there is some good technical background on the tools that I talked about at greasethief.com. Okay, and one last question. Um, if you can observe differences in color between two grease samples, what would that indicate? Okay, so if, if you have, let's say, a very um, noticeable color grease, let's say it's been dyed, uh, green or red or blue, and then you have a sample and it looks a completely different color. It went from red to blue. That's a pretty clear indication that someone has grabbed the wrong grease, has been pumping the wrong grease into that location, or someone didn't get the memo on what we were supposed to initially pack that bearing with. Uh, if you see a color that over time has darkened, let's say it's a tan colored grease and now it's getting more like it's brown couple possibilities. One is that it could be subjected to oxidation stresses, heat, uh, excessive working, and so forth. These will have a tendency to darken grease over time. Now, the possibility is that there's a mixing between two different greases. So maybe you had a light-colored tan grease, maybe a darker blue or green grease. Now, together, it does look kind of brownish. So it, it's hard to say. You know that it's different, and it's worth checking it out, but just visually, you wouldn't be able to pinpoint exactly what was responsible for those changes. Great. OK, well, um, sorry we don't have more time for questions, but um, you're welcome to uh, email Rich or call Rich with any further questions. Uh, but just a couple of last-minute uh, announcements here. Um, first of all, I want to thank Rich for his presentation, and, uh, and I also want to thank everyone for joining. I want to bring everybody's attention to the links over on the left side of your screen. Uh, the first link is the any of the uh, RP webinars. This is number six, so you can get copies or recordings of any of the others there. Uh, you'll get an email from for this one uh, tomorrow, so you'll be able to to uh, hear that and get a copy of the presentation. The second link is for all OEA past webinars, so that's including the uh, the market reports that was last week, for example. And then finally, um, to get the hard copy or the, the electronic copy of the actual RP, so you can get that on the third link. Um, that, uh, oh, I guess one more thing I pitched you for. If you are interested in contributing to any of these RPs, we're always looking for more people. If you have a specialty area uh, or know someone who might be interested, uh, please let us know, and we'll, we'll uh, get you started on that. Uh, so thank you again for participating, and thank you again, Rich, for that great presentation. And that concludes today.